Salutations, ladies and gentlemen, the Knife Raven here, back again with another video. And in today's video, well, I actually seem to be responding to an open tag. I know, it feels like an eternity. But this is one that very much piqued my interest, and it was Show Us Your Warren Cliff Blades by J.O. Ventures Outdoors. And this is, again, open tag, meaning that anyone can respond if they wish, whether in video format or in just the comments. But I figured I'd do a video as it would give me a chance to bring out as many Warren Cliffs as I possibly could. And also put into perspective, I don't have as many of them as I thought. But without further ado, we'll start off the collection with, I suppose, a reliable knife. And I'm already prepared for the collective groan. Here we are with the Etric. Now, it should be known that this is one of a few. But this particular model is in rosewood. It's just been oiled, actually. And the rosewood used to be fairly light in coloration, but now it would seem that it has darkened quite significantly, which is actually quite nice, but again, the Etric is a very old pattern. It was supposed to be designed by Lord Warrencliffe and his gamekeeper as a small gutting knife, and that probably dates it to around the mid to maybe the early to mid 1800s. But this is a very simple knife, carbon steel blade, brass linings and pins, nickel silver bolsters, and the fit and finish on this one's actually very, very nice. Considering the price I got this at, which was 14 pounds, this was an absolute steal. But try to move through these quickly as I have quite a few of them. Second one is this one, and this was a special factory order in Bog Oak. Same specifications as the other one. Very short blade, legal almost anywhere. See, this one's got a bit of a patina, and it was also recently oiled. This one has a very nice grain to it. I very much enjoy Bog Oak. It's perhaps my favorite handle material, and it has a nice texture to it. Typical of Arthur Wright knives out of Sheffield, these have very strong springs, although I wouldn't say they're nail breakers by any means. So there you are, Bog Oak Etric. Moving forward, I will space them a little. Here we have a knife also out of Sheffield, but from a different brand. And this is a Joseph Rogers in Rosewood, and this one has a very nice, smooth feel to it. There used to be a crest here, but unfortunately it wasn't stamped or I should say there was no shield. It was just, I believe, stamped on instead of in to the handle. And so it has faded and, well, disappeared. But you have a nice broader Warncliffe blade here. This is a swayback. The grind on the blade's a little iffy and almost makes it look like a peach pruner, but that isn't the only uneven thing about this knife, unfortunately. I don't tend to carry this one very often, but it's a nice stainless steel blade, satin finished. The bulbous handle is very comfortable in the hand, and again, you have a very strong back spring here, with a very nice snap. But there you are, Joseph Rogers, Warncliffe. Uh, here we have a pretty iconic one. This is the Swayback Gent by Case Knives out of the U.S. And this one is in their vintage jigged bone. And you have a nice small Warncliffe blade with a nice polish on it. Unfortunately, there is this, at least in my opinion, ugly stamp right in the center of the blade where you have the two X's. And I could definitely go without that, but that's just me. Double, double bolsters, so this one is capped with a brass case shield, brass pins, brass liners. Note the unevenness of the bone, although this doesn't bother me, as jig bone and stag tend to do that. This is probably the smallest, or at very least the second smallest, Warncliffe knife I have. And while the handle is very, very small, the blade 
is almost identical in size to the Etric, although the case seems a bit more rounded and is quite a bit smoother and thinner, whereas the Etric is just a bit more roughly finished. But both are very nice knives, although bear in mind this one had a much lower price tag. So there you are, Case Swayback Gent. Moving forward, we have another Arthurite. This one is a bit of a custom. This is the Senator pattern, which is, I believe, a traditional Sheffield model. And it's characterized by its twin bolster design, equal end, with a very slight curvature downwards in this position. And these normally come with a lamb's foot blade. However, in this particular instance, I will wipe some of the oil off. I couldn't see it being a bit of a nuisance. This is fitted with a Warncliffe blade. And again, this is a much broader, beefier Warncliffe than the likes on the Etric. And this would definitely make for a tougher, everyday use knife. Again, we have a rosewood for the handles. Not a huge fan of the grain pattern on this one, but still quite nice to the touch. This one has been used a fair bit, as evident by the very, very noticeable patina. But the spring on this one isn't as strong as some of the others, but it still has a nice snap. So there you are, Senator with a Tackler's Blade. Moving forward, we have a bit of a modern one, and this is technically... I was debating whether or not I should put this one in, but I figured it is half of the knife, so I think it counts. Here is the Lion Steel Best Man from Maniago, Italy, and the main blade, at least well, the larger of the two, is a clip point. However, the secondary blade, you can see, is a very nice Warrencliffe. And again, I would say the size is quite comparable to the likes of the Tackler blade here. Although there is a very distinct difference in the nail nick. Line Steel has nail nicks on both ends. There are also the French nail nick variety, and this model is made of carbon steel, whereas this is M390, which is a very, very high-end powder metallurgy steel. We also have dual swedges on the lion steel, whereas, well, nothing on the Arthur Wright. Again, as I said previously, the price point of this knife is a lot lower than probably even the cheapest you're going to get this at. This is a very chunky knife and one that doesn't get a huge amount of pocket time as it is quite, quite substantial. But if you're looking for a tougher, um, I guess you could say more hardy knife, this would definitely fit the bill. So there you are, Lion Steel Best Man Warncliffe. We're going to go back to the Reliable with another Etric. This one is in Buffalo Horn, and despite having a nice sheen to it, this is probably the worst put-together one, as I don't know how well the camera can pick this up, but I'll actually open the blade first. This one has some very substantial gapping, not only between the spring and the liner, but also between the liner and the cover. And you can see the table on the other side as the gaps are quite noticeable. But aside from that, this is again still a nice Warncliffe blade with the buffalo horn handles. And a fairly good action on this one. So there you are, buffalo etric. Here is another etric. You've already seen this one. This is in Bog Oak. This is just my second version. And the only thing really different about this one is a slightly, well, smaller nail nick and also a different stamp. 
This one seems to be one of the better finished ones, and again, nice profile on the blade. I would have appreciated a swedge, but this is one of my absolute favorites. Very, very strong action on this. Almost scary. Wouldn't want to get your finger in front of that. So there you are, Etrick in Bog Oak. Here next up we have a German knife. This is the Ottermesser Webermesser. And this is a traditional swayback as well. A bit of a lazy half stop and a very, very stiff action. You've got carbon steel bolsters, which actually have a very nice patina that matches with the one on the blade. You have a nice nail nick here and fairly broad blade. This is definitely not the beefiest Warren Cliff in the world, but at the same time, it's definitely more substantial than, say, something like the Case Swayback or an Etric. The wood here is actually very nice. It has a nice grain pattern to it and a bit of a sheen. This is, I believe, what was the definition? Kotibe wood. And it seems to be a fairly inexpensive timber, so for a cheap wood, this looks very, very nice, and all, all this is just a bit of mineral oil. But, again, nice vintage-looking knife here. And I would probably carry this one a lot more often if it weren't for the fairly noticeable bend in the blade, which is a bit of a disappointment. But otherwise, this is a very nice knife with an incredibly strong action. So there you are, Otter Weaver's Knife, or the Weber Messer. Moving forward, we have another modern one, and this is probably a very recognizable piece. This is the Spidercoat Dragonfly 2. However, this version has a Warncliffe blade. And this is Probably the weirdest Warncliffe blade I have, which is not surprising considering anything Spyderco does is at least a little weird. But you have a nice straight edge here, as is typical with Warncliffe's. One thing I do quite like about this is we have jimping on the bottom and the top of the blade, which makes for a very, very secure grip. I could see this being an excellent box cutter and the like. You have the boy dent, which makes for closing the knife. And it I, I tend to prefer knives with this when they're lockbacks. They may they may ruin the lines of it, but they definitely make closing quite a bit easier. But there you are. You've got your FRN fiberglass reinforced nylon handles with bi-directional texturing, and of course you have your deep carry wire pocket clip and a lanyard hole. Definitely a bit modern for my, my liking, but I could see if I wanted a small light knife to bring with me that has a straight edge, this would definitely be one of the, the top choices of mine. So there you are, Spyderco Dragonfly 2 Warncliffe. Moving forward, we have another small yet modern Warncliffe that would be an excellent box opener. This one is the CRKT PEC, or Precision Engineered Compact Knife. The PEC is probably the hardest one to open out of all of these, and it has a very small little stud here, and it's very, very small and quite hard to engage, but when you do, you have a nice frame lock here, and this is a very, well, minimalist piece, as there are no handles or liners, it's just the frame lock section and then the blade, and then a very noticeable clip. Now, this is definitely the weirdest, I'd probably have to say, in overall design, as it it just doesn't really know what it wants to be. It, it looks like some small piece of heavy machinery that, if lost, would cause the entire 
machine to fail, but at the same time is looking like it's trying to imitate a box cutter, which it probably would be quite good at. One thing about this that is quite odd is the chisel grind, which you really never see on traditional knives. It does make for an interesting aesthetic, but I would definitely not say it's my favorite, as again, opening it is anything but easy, and closing it is, well, it's a little easier, but it's not exactly the most comfortable piece for me. Again, we have a, a finish on this. I believe this is called their, uh, it's not a stone wash. I think this is the bead blasted finish. Just a very matte gray, a little bit bland, but again, I don't think this is designed for a collector or an enthusiast, but rather this is designed for someone who wants a small knife to possibly bring to work that most likely won't scare anyone and help in opening boxes and the like. But it was worth mentioning, despite being definitely a bit more of a, of a peculiar one. So there you are, CRKT Peck. Moving back to traditionals, we have a custom knife. This one is one of my favorites also. This is by Michael May of Sheffield, England. We have a large Warncliffe here. Oh and a very large bit of pocket lint, oh my goodness. There we are. We have a nice Warncliffe blade here. This one I asked to have in stainless steel. This is 420HC. And unlike most of Michael's knives, which are C70 or 01 carbon, we have brass bolsters, which is a very nice change and I think blends beautifully with the bog oak. Very nice knife to hold. Again, it's thicker at the back, thinner at the front, which makes for an excellent grip. And also, being a custom knife, it's no surprise there was a bit of embellishment here. And we have a nice bit of hand-done file work, or to those who are more interested in French knives, such as the Laguiole, this might be known as guillochage. But very nice little bit of detail to add to a knife. And this could just as easily be a, a high-class gentleman's knife for perhaps, perhaps a special occasion, just as well as it could be an everyday user knife that you aren't afraid to put into your pocket. Not as strong of an action on this one. And this knife, unfortunately, has had to be... It's been repaired once before. There was a problem with the spring, and thankfully that's been sorted out. So the fit and finish on this was almost immaculate, but having to take a knife apart and put it back together, there's a bit of there's a bit of gapping in here, although the file work does a very nice job of hiding some of it, but there is a bit of gapping. But there you are, Michael May, Swayback in Bog Oak. Moving forward, we have a knife I've never showcased before, I don't believe, and this is one that I got last year around Christmas, and... I never did a review on it because, well, first of all, I wasn't exactly motivated to talk about it, but also I didn't really know what to say. This is a Rough Rider knife. This is the Seahorse, and this is part of their Classic Carbon 2 series. And I guess if this knife ever gets a full review, I will discuss this more in depth, but brief description. We have nickel silver bolsters with the admittedly ugly R, in, well, on one side, thankfully not both. Um, brass liners with a backspacer, being a split back design, two springs, a pewter shield, which I will admit does look quite nice, albeit a little bit big. And we have three blades here with the match strike pull. Oh my goodness, I really need to take some of the oil off. Okay, there we are. Let's get some of that off so you can actually see the blade. This is, I believe, T10 Carbon Steel, which is a steel I'd never heard of or used prior. And we have a very, very interesting Warrencliffe profile here. You can see the kick of the tang here is very, very extended. And so makes for a 
very comfortable grip here. But unfortunately, the blade, again, has patinaed, but only halfway, as I only got a little bit of use in before, well, before something happened to this knife, and that I will show you quickly. But it's a bit, it's a bit ugly here. We have half of a patinaed blade instead of either a full patina or no patina. This is the Rough Rider 2217 made in China with swedges on either end of the blade, which I will admit does look very nice. And we have some nice textured black micarta. So interesting knife, and it does come with two extra blades. Oh, that's the bad one. Half stops on all of them. This one's a pen blade. And so is this one. Again, get some of that oil off. Now, you might have already seen it. The action on this one's okay. The action on this main blade is, well, it's incredibly flimsy. And it did not come this way. Originally, it was actually very stiff, almost to the point of competing with Sheffield knives. Now, a split back Whittler is supposed to have a particularly st stiff main blade, and that's because the two secondary blade, pardon me, the two secondary springs that work the pen blades converged the center to access the main Warncliffe blade. And because of that, you're essentially working against two springs instead of one, which would make for a tighter pull. However, through some reasons I have yet to figure out, this spring on the left side decided to bend in the center, right here. And I'm really hoping the camera, there we are. And now what this does, not only does it make the entire knife look offset and have a spring sticking up no matter which way you push it, but also we now have a flimsy main blade and this secondary pen blade has no spring tension anymore. It is now essentially a mediocre friction folder. So this has greatly, th this, this knife is almost unusable. And I suppose you could argue that the main blade you can still use if you just keep your finger in front of it. That is true, but I would put this within the realm of a critical failure. And when you have knives that, that feature gaps or slightly offset blades, issues with the edge or perhaps grind unevenness, that's all bad, yes. But I feel like we, as collectors at least, tend to be a bit picky about some things, and I will own that. I am picky about my knives. But there are some issues that you can't just pass off as imperfection. Little bits of gapping, that's imperfection. Slightly offset blade that isn't rubbing the liners, but could be nearing it. That is a bit more annoying, but that's still imperfection. A spring that doesn't function properly, and thus causes the main blade to be flimsy, and also one of the secondary blades to be just unusable, that is not excusable. Now, you are probably wondering why haven't I gone through the process of contacting Rough Rider about this, and I know I have been negligent. I definitely should have done something about it earlier on, but at the same time, I wasn't sure if I wanted to contact the seller instead, as opposed to contacting the company directly, and then I ended up doing nothing about it, and I still have the knife almost a year later. So, you learn from your mistakes, and I hope that Rough Rider has, well, started making springs that are a bit more resilient than this, because um, that's, that's just not okay. But, unfortunately, that knife, well, as bad as it may be, still looks interesting enough, So, and it's a Warncliffe. I figured I'd throw it in. Now, to purge that somewhat disappointing experience of a knife, here is a much nicer Rough Rider. And this one is part of their Rough Rider Reserve series, which is the nicer, higher-end 
line of knives, and this is the quill cliff. Now the quill cliff has a very interesting design to it. I would call this a, I believe, serpentine or reverse dog leg, I've heard it also referred to as. And this is a very nice knife with stainless steel milled bolsters, smooth black linen micarta handles, and a match struck blade with a very nice half stop. And this is made with D2 tool steel. And for those of you who don't know, I very much enjoy D2. It isn't the absolute highest end steel in the world, but it somewhat bridges the gap, I suppose, between a stainless and a carbon steel, meeting in the middle as a tool steel. And again, you can see this one has a bit of a satin finish and a very, very long swedge can see starting quite close to the base of the blade moving all the way down to the tip and I must say this is a very very sleek knife it's a bit broader in the front and thinner at the back which is unusual but still quite comfortable and it has a very nice spring to it you can see it's quite broad in the spring thickness although the knife itself is quite thin very, very positive half stop, as I've already said, with a nice brass shield. And there is a stop pin in here, I believe over there, so you don't have to worry about any kind of blade wrap when you close it. I believe I got this for around 50 or 60 pounds, 50, 50 pounds. I know it was within the realm of a case knife in cost, so definitely not cheap, but not overpriced either. So there you are, Rough Rider Reserve Quill Cliff. Very, very impressed with that one. Um, here we have another Etric. This is my first Etric in ebony. And this one has been very, very poorly sharpened a couple times. You can see that's a horrible edge, but that was my doing, not Arthur Wright's. And I'm planning on fixing that, smoothing it out. But aside from that, we have a nice knife that has held up very well in over two years of fairly consistent use. But again, the start of a collection, certainly not the end of it. Well, I suppose almost done here. Here we have another case knife. This one is the Seahorse Whittler. A better Seahorse Whittler than that, by the way. Nickel Silver Bolsters. Nickel silver shield, brass pins and liners. There's no split back here, just the two springs. And we have a nice mirror polished blade made of cases. True sharp, surgical stainless steel. Again, not the greatest steel in the world, but for what it is, I don't really mind. This one was produced according to the Tang stamp. This one was made in 2020. And... There's your model number for those interested. One thing I've noticed about this seahorse, it does seem to have a bit of a downward curvature, which I think is kind of interesting to technically have the blade level. You can see the handle has to be held like this. Comfortable in the hand, very long handle. We have a very, very broad blade, I'm thinking 2.7 millimeters perhaps on that maybe three and of course this is working off of two springs which unfortunately are a bit raised but we have a nice thwack on the closure and the opening is quite stiff as well secondary blades are actually different unlike that we have a small sheep's foot or coping blade on the left, and a pen blade on the right. Unfortunately, these are very, very thin and thus quite delicate. My only real complaint with this knife in its design is you have a main blade that is too thick and then two secondary blades that are too thin. But aside from that, it's a very nice knife. The handle here is 
here we are with case and their overly long names. Blue denim peach seed jigged bone. And I suppose, there you are, it almost comes off as black here, but it is just a very dark navy blue. You can see at the edge, you can actually pick up on the blue quite well. But typical with case, it's a very pretty knife. Um, Maybe not the absolute top of the line in quality, but very, very pretty nonetheless. Again, with the serpentine shape. Um, here we have another Etric. Yes, I'm not surprised here, and I don't think many of you are either. This is my most recent one in olive wood. These have since sold out, and I'm not surprised as to why, due to that beautiful grain. This is one of the nicest Etrix I have due to the blade actually coming sharp, which for an Arthur Wright is quite a rarity. And also we have a swedge up at the top, which also is quite uncommon. As you can see there, it's definitely more slight than some other swedges, but it's still there. I think it's a lot sleeker than the average Etric. Again, fit and finish on the more recent Arthur Wrights seems to be better than the fit and finish on the older ones. And I believe we are done, except for one last knife. And I saved, I say the best for last, and that's really up to the individual, but this is definitely the most mysterious knife as I don't know anything about it. This was a knife I found at a small gun show, and it is a pattern I don't really know the name of. It almost looks like it's attempting to be a doctor's knife, but then it has a curve in it, and doctor's knives don't have that. So then I thought perhaps it's going for, say, the slim Barlow look, with a slightly extended bolster and a long slightly curved handle. Now, the proportions are obviously wrong, but the base design could be quite similar. The bolster is made of brass with what looks like a nickel or stainless pin going through. Brass and, again, I believe stainless steel pins. Brass liners and a back spring, which seems to have a bit of a, I'm thinking that's patina, Hopefully it's not rust. Yeah, that looks to be patina, although it isn't exactly the prettiest as it doesn't go throughout the entire spring. It's actually very even when it comes to the grinds, and the handles are in this very nice stag. Quite a bit of detailing here. As I say, it's got a bit of a bit of the coffee grounds in the bark. But the reason this knife interested me so much is because of the blade, which is very, very stiff. And this is, there we are, a very nice Warncliffe. It's actually got a bit of a belly to it, which Technically, it isn't supposed to have, as Warren Cliffs are supposed to have a straight edge with nothing like any kind of curve in them. I guess that's pretty close, but there's a bit of an unevenness there. Hello, Alice. But the blade is very, very sharp. I was kind of shocked. It's still quite sharp. I haven't used this knife a whole lot, but... The edge is, it, it's beautifully, beautifully done. But the unfortunate thing about this is I don't know the maker of this particular piece. There is no stamp on the tang or even on the bolster. And there's nothing to even suggest the country of origin. I'm still thinking this is some kind of tool steel as it hasn't rusted like a carbon steel would. But at the same time, there does seem to be a bit of bit of tarnish up there, so I'm thinking it's not just a stainless steel. But whatever this is, 
I still think it is one of my most prized knives simply because of the fact I, I can't put a name to it. This might be a one-of-a-kind piece. And again, another thing about this that is odd, it has dished liners, which are typical of Sheffield knife makers, but again, how a brand new Sheffield knife ended up in a gun show here in Canada, I'm not entirely sure. And the man at the booth didn't know anything about this knife either, besides the fact that it's a very, very stiff action. But regardless, this is, again, maybe not the very best knife out of all of these, and I don't know if I'd call it my favorite, but it's definitely the one with the most blanks to be filled. And I, again, I take this opportunity to ask if anyone knows a maker who produces knives with a similar style to this, or could point me in the direction of someone who might be selling some of these, I'd be very curious to know because this is, this is just a, it's a total enigma of a knife. For all I know, I have one of, a hundred or a thousand mass-produced, or at very least, small batch-produced production knives from, say, India. And I know stag is very big in India. But at the same time, I could be holding a custom knife from a maker who has since evolved and now knows to put their, their mark on the tang. I don't know, but regardless, this is still one of the most interesting pieces that I have. And very much like to know more about it. But there you are. That is my complete collection of Warren Cliffs. And it is my favorite blade shape without really any competition. I love clip points and lamb foots and the like. And there is my cat. But the Warren Cliff has always and probably will always be my, my favorite blade. And there is just something so utilitarian about it. It offers an immense amount of utility, while at the same time being a very attractive blade shape. It's very sleek. The lines of it are nearly unmatched. And I very much appreciate makers who still produce Warren Cliffs, even in the modern variety. As I know, it is quite the old blade shape, and we tend to be always moving forward as a world. So when when you see makers still holding on to the traditional blades and patterns, that's always something that I appreciate. And uh, I apologize that the majority of this video has been etric, etric, and more etric, but, you know, that, that is something that just comes with being a collector of a, a very specific pattern. But... I hope you enjoyed that. I have a somewhat diverse batch of materials here, and hopefully hopefully you weren't too bored with this. This is a much longer video than what I usually like doing, but again, it it was something that that I figured would be fun. I normally don't respond to open tags because there are just so many of them, and if I spent my time responding to them, I'd never get any other videos done. And as it is, I barely get any videos done. But I figured this was one I just could not pass up. As if it's a discussion and showcase of a blade shape I really, really enjoy. I, I couldn't pass this one up. So, thank you very much for watching if you have made it this far. And again, let me know in the comments which of these you might prefer any of these your favorites, and perhaps let me know if um, if you have a collection of Warren Cliffs and maybe make a video or respond just simply in the comments. Again, thank you to J.O. Ventures Outdoors for this wonderful open tag and finally giving me the chance to just bring out my entire Warren Cliff collection and showcase them here. And while I'm sure my video probably pales in comparison to the responses many others have done, I still figured I'd join in and take part in an open tag when I usually don't end up doing so. So, thank you very much for watching.
this has been my response to the Show Us Your Warrencliffe Blades open tag. And this has been the Knife Raven. And as always, I'm signing off. Goodbye.